In this video we're going to derive Snell's law using the calculus of variations. Now we've already seen a derivation of Snell's law using Fermat's principle of least time and a, a little bit of geometry. So if you head to the snippet section there you'll be able to see this uh, little derivation. So if we think about one medium here, say this is the medium is air and light is travelling at a velocity v1 in this medium, uh, that's a beam of light there striking that uh, boundary between the, the mediums and if we think about this medium here is say being some kind of liquid and the uh, light travels at a velocity v2 in that liquid then the light's going to be refracted which is bent at this junction now if we were to call that angle phi 1 call that one angle phi 2 then we can see that the sine of phi 1 upon v1 equals the sine of phi 2 upon v2 just equals some constant. So that there is Snell's law. And you head to the snippet section, you'll see that derivation. It's quite a simple geometric derivation. Now what we're going to do is we're going to derive the same thing, but we're going to derive it using the calculus of variations. So before we get started, I'll remind you of a, a couple of little identities that we're going to use further on. Okay, so if we look at the Pythagoras theorem in term, terms of infinitesimal, so we call that dx, we call that uh, dy, and that's going to be called ds. Then we can say that our ds squared is equal to our dx squared plus dy squared. And if we divide throughout by dx squared, we get ds squared upon dx squared equals 1 plus and we can replace that with y derivative squared. Uh, if we were to then take the root of both sides, you're left with our um, ds upon dx equals 1 plus y derivative squared all to the power of a half. Okay. Now if we were to take the reciprocal of that, we would have our dx upon ds would equal 1 plus y derivative squared to the power of minus a half. Now that dx by ds is this length here divided by that length there. So if we call that angle phi, that means that this whole thing here, uh, dx upon ds, is just equal our cos phi. Now, if we were to also look at, say, y derivative upon uh, 1 plus y derivative squared um, all to the power of a half, then well, y derivative is just our dy by dx. Okay, and this um, 1 plus y derivative squared to the power of a half, it's, it's actually the reciprocal of that, it's 1 over. Well, that is just equal to the value dx upon ds. Okay, so that whole thing can be replaced by, that can be replaced by dx upon ds. Now, those cancel out. We're left with dy by ds. Now, dy by ds is that length divided by that length, which is the sine of that angle phi. So that's the sign of that angle phi. So we're going to use these couple of identities in the rest of this little uh, derivation. So we know that that identity there and that this thing here is equal to our sine phi. So we're going to be using those. Now, we want to minimize our time. So we know that the Instantaneous velocity is equal to ds by dt, so we can change that round about so that dt equals ds upon v. And if we say that our value mu is the reciprocal of the velocity, 1 upon v, then that whole thing then can be written as uh, dt equals our mu ds. Now, that's one infinitesimal time given one infinitesimal distance so if we want to find the total time we're going to have to add up all those little uh, infinitesimals so we have to integrate from a to b 
of our view ds and that there will give us our minimum time just call it i but we can replace this value ds with 1 plus y derived the square to the power of a half times dx okay so we can then say that our value i equals the integral from a to b of mu 1 plus y derived of squared uh, by dx. Now, we want to minimize this, okay? So that's our function we want to minimize, and we're going to use our Euler Lagrange in order to do that. So partial f by partial y minus d by dx of partial f upon partial y derivative will equal zero. Now, the first term here, partial f upon partial y, well, uh, none of what's in the bracket is uh, dependent, that's the power of a half as well, none of that what's in the bracket is dependent on the value of y, okay, y derivative, in this case not y, uh, but mu, which is reciprocal velocity, well, velocity is just purely positional dependent, so it's dependent on the x and the y position, so that mu is dependent on our value of y. So we can then write the first term as partial mu upon partial y, and the rest of it just looks like a constant, 1 plus y derivative squared to the power of a half. And the second term here is minus d by dx. Now partial f upon partial y derivative, well, mu is not a function of y derivative, so that just remains as is. And when we differentiate this, so it's, we're going to have half of 1 plus y derivative squared to the minus a half, and then differentiate what's inside, and it gives 2 y derivative. So the 2s and the halves will cancel out, and we have 1 plus y derivative squared to the minus a half times y derivative. Okay, now we're not going to get any further with this derivation here. We're going to start looking at it in a geometric sense. So... What we had above was just a single junction, okay, so the light came in across that junction was bent, so let's imagine we had lots of junctions. So if we had lots of junctions there, then the light would come in and it would bend through the first one, second one, third one, fourth one. And let's imagine that we had a medium which had a continuous refractive index with respect to the y direction, so that whenever the light came in, it would just bend down. In a constant curve. Okay, so that's what we're going to, how we're going to think of the light travelling. So I'll get rid of that just now, just to just not clutter this up. Okay, so if we were to draw it out in terms of our axis system, an x and a y axis, so we'll say that's x and that's y. Then if I can try and draw a curve in here and say this is the, the curve that the light travels on through this medium whose refractive index is continually changes with respect to y then I could draw the tangent to that so if I can get this up here okay I can draw the tangent to that that's actually making this sitting at zero okay so draw the tangent like that there then we can find out these little angles so with that angle phi we have our infinitesimal distance here dy we have infinitesimal distance here, dx, and this length here is infinitesimal uh, length on the curve um, ds. Okay, Let's just write that a wee bit neater. Okay, so that means that we can then go in and replace these terms here with what we have above, because we we know what they relate to uh, with respect to the geometry of the situation. So we can relieve leave that partial y mu by partial y, so we've got partial mu by partial y. Now the 1 plus y derivative squared to the power of a half, well, we've seen that up here. Uh, 1 plus y derivative squared to the power of a half, well, that's just equal to our ds by dx. Okay, so we can replace that by uh, ds by dx, and what we'll do is we'll 
that whole thing equals zero, so take the whole thing over to the other side. So that equals uh, dy dx. Well, dy dx, well, what's inside that bracket? So what's inside the bracket is going to be mu. And the 1 plus y derivative squared to the minus a half times y derivative. Well, we've seen it up here as well. That there is this here, which is our sine of our angle phi. So that whole thing can be replaced by our sine over angle phi. Now, what we could do is we can take this across to our side, so we end up with our partial mu upon partial y equals, now the dx is cancelled, you end up with a d by ds over mu sine of phi. Okay, now that value mu is a, a velocity, and that velocity is a function purely of its of position. So that's a, a function of our x and y. Okay. So mu is the reciprocal of the velocity, but the velocity is a function of x and y. So mu is a function of x and y. So what we could do is we could say, if we wanted to, we could say mu is a function of x and y, and we could draw out a graph, a, a, a curve of where mu is equal to a constant. Now, if we were to do that up here, so this line here is the uh, path that the ray of light takes through the medium when it gets refracted. But we could draw a curve of constant velocity. Now, the curve of constant velocity here, it would come up like this. And it would just be a, a curve running this way here. Okay. Now, this curve here, at that point, if we were to take the normal to the curve there, of constant velocity. Well, that's the normal to curve of constant velocity, which is just the x-axis, because it cuts the x-axis at 90 degrees. Okay, and then if we take the tangent to the curve of the actual direction of light, then that will make an angle phi. Okay, so the value mu sine phi will have that value, which is that constant. Okay, so if we were to pick a different value for mu then we would have a different curve, so the curve would be up here somewhere. So that would be a, a family of level curves of constant mu. But that curve there, if we were to take the, if we take a different point up here, if we were to take that curve of constant velocity, and we were also to take the tangent of the actual path of the, the, um, the ray of light, then the angle of that made, uh, with the angle that we made would be, would be phi, and that angle would sine phi would be a constant. So it wouldn't matter where you chose, as long as you were choosing a point on this line here, you'll find then that the value of mu sine phi would equal a constant if the value of mu is a constant. So if the, we'll, we'll, we'll add this into our, uh, our reckoning here. So if we're saying mu is a constant, we can see the left hand side there, we differentiate that constant becomes zero. So we're going to have 0 equals d by ds over mu sine phi. Now, we, what we've said here from the geometric description here of these level curves and the level curves cutting the, um, the actual path of the uh, ray of light, then this value here, mu sine phi, would always be a constant. Okay? So it would mean then that mu sine phi wouldn't be, uh, wouldn't have any dependence on uh, ds, okay? So it means that uh, mu sine phi would be constant with respect to ds. So if we were to move a little element ds further up the curve, mu sine phi would still be uh, the same value if we moved a little further. So anywhere we moved up that curve, that mu sine phi would always be a constant, so it wouldn't be dependent on the position along that curve. Okay, so we're able to say then that our value mu sine of phi equals some constant c. Now we know that the value mu is equal to one upon the velocity, so we're therefore saying that sine of phi upon v equals some constant c. 
which again is just Snell's law. So it's just another um, way of deriving Snell's law. Also gives you some information about the derivation um, when we think of it in terms of not just one layer, but when the light passes through um, a, a continuous a layer of continuous um, refractive index with respect to the y direction. Okay, so that's all for this video. I hope that's of use, and uh, I'll get you in the next video. Okay, bye bye.